Good evening. Welcome again to Garden Hour, brought to you by SDSU Extension each week at this hour. I am Rhoda Burroughs, SDSU Extension Specialist uh, in Horticulture, and I will be your host this evening. Tonight's panelists will include Patrick Wagner, Entomology Extension Field Specialist. And Patrick, would you like to tell us what you might be talking about tonight? Sure. Uh, so I'm just going to be touching on some of the insects that we've been uh, getting reports about, things that are just kind of timely topics, I guess. And, you know, some of these insects you've probably heard about already on Garden Hour uh, might be a review for some folks, but other things, uh, probably not so much. Um, it might be new to some folks. So should be a, a good little topic here to, to discuss. Great. I know we're getting a lot of questions about insects, as always, uh, during the summer. Uh, Christine Lind, Christine uh, Lind, I should say, is a horticulture outreach consultant for Macquarie Gardens, and she will be joining us a little bit later. And also we have Christine Lang, a consumer horticulture extension specialist. Christina, I know you had some really beautiful slides you you sent me. Yeah, so tonight I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit about my travels as well as what I've been up to the last several months at McCrory Gardens with some trial gardens. I've got a few events to update to everyone about and I do have some homework for all of you so hang tight for that. <laughs> all right and I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what to do with your vegetables when you harvest them. How can you store them so that you can keep them? Uh, if you don't get them used up right away, you can keep them a little bit longer. So tonight we, we will start with uh, Patrick. Take it away, Patrick. And I will get your... All right, well, thanks, Rhoda. There we are. Awesome. All right, so I know this one's probably familiar to folks that um, have been watching Garden Hour here in, in past weeks, but this is one that um, I continue to get lots of calls about. <laughs> it seems like it's kind of been never ending. Probably, yeah, started and beginning to mid-July, probably mid-July, I guess. And it's just been kind of continuing um, through all of July and August um, and even into September. But these are the cicada killer wasps. And um, folks are always asking about them, bringing in these big wasps and they're concerned because they're, I mean, they're kind of terrifying, I guess. If you see this large wasp, they're, you know, at least an inch to two inches long on these things. So they're really big and can be, uh, kind of terrifying, but they're actually, you know, they're, they're not really harmless to people at all. Um, they call them cicada killers because they will hunt and kill the, the cicadas that are buzzing up in the trees this time of the year. Um, what they'll do is they'll actually uh, catch one of those things and they'll actually do that with grasshoppers too. I've seen them capture grasshoppers, so I guess that's a small bonus with these wasps. Um, but they'll catch a cicada and then they'll, you know, they'll have dig a hole in the ground and they'll bury that cicada and lay an egg on it. And then its larva will then feed on that cicada and then hatch the following year. So if you want to go to the next slide, that kind of shows some pictures here. And no, they're not murder hornets. <laughs> and I think that's uh, oftentimes why people bring them in or why it really freaks people out. I know murder hornets or the, the Asian giant hornets, Japanese hornets, whatever you want to call them, um, have been in the news again uh, here in uh, recent weeks because I think they did find another uh, nest of them up in Washington state. Uh, so far, it's been isolated to the Pacific Northwest and we do not have murder hornets in South Dakota that I know of, <laughs> but people continue to bring stuff in these big wasps. So one of them is the cicada killer uh, and those top two, the pictures there in the top left that you can see, those are uh, cicada killers. The one on the far left 
that's one that um, an individual sent me a couple weeks ago that you can see it has a cicada uh, that it's dragging there probably off to its hole in the ground where it's going to go lay an egg on it. And then the other picture is uh, some other, just a whole grouping of cicada killers. I think those came from the uh, public pools here in Rapid City. Uh, there were some folks that were concerned because these things were apparently terrorizing children that they were flying around. And again, they they might look terrifying. And you know, the the males are actually pretty aggressive that they're they'll be really territorial and come after you. But the males don't even have a stinger, so they physically cannot sting you. Um, and the females, it's going to be a last resort thing. They're not. They got bigger fish to fry. They're not going to come after you. So again, not a murder hornet. And then I did include some other things that people have brought in uh, that they also think are murder hornets. And on the top right there, that one's called a horntail wasp. And the horntails, they get their name because they have that last segment on the end there, kind of has that spike. Um, so I guess it's kind of a, a the horn and that's, again, that's how they get their name. With these ones, I got to hand it to folks. They look really close with the, if you look at the face on these things and you compare it to a murder hornet, the face looks pretty similar. So I think that's really what gets people. And then again, they're a, a very large size um, with these things. Now the, the horn tails, they're actually a wood boring insect. Uh, so they're gonna be uh, coming out of like dead or dying trees. That's where they, uh, they like to go. That's their preferred habitat. They seem to really like cottonwood trees. Um, <laughs> it seems like uh, anybody that brings one of those in, they usually have a, a, a dead cottonwood or, or old cottonwood tree on their property. So I think they just kind of hatch out of there and, and then people see them and kind of freaks them out. But again, these ones not going to sting you either. They're harmless. Uh, it's better off just leaving them alone. And then the bottom one is, uh, we call that an ichnemon wasp. And these ones, again, another large size wasp. It can really kind of freak people out because they'll see these on the sides of trees. And ichnemon wasps will actually uh, parasitize other insects, wood boring insects that are in the tree. Um, so they'll, you see they have this big long tail at the back end. Um, and that's called an ovipositor. It's kind of a modified stinger that they'll use to lay eggs. And they'll stick that ovipositor into an, you know, an existing hole in the tree and find some little wood boring larva inside the tree and they'll lay an egg on it. So these are actually beneficial that they'll be you know, killing any insect that's gonna be burrowing in a tree. Uh, you can see they have those other kind of look, tail-like looking things up on the top. That's actually the, the sheath that the ovipositor will go into um, when it, they're, they're not actively laying eggs. So that just kind of protects that, that ovipositor of that wasp. So all of these pretty much harmless. Um, again, not murder hornets, but it's just a timely topic that <laughs> people have been bringing these in uh, pretty much on a daily basis. I either get calls or, or uh, people, you know, walk-ins emails, everything, you name it. Uh, so if we want to move on to the next slide here, we have uh, blister beetles. Now, this is another one that I've been, uh, you know, people have been asking about uh, pretty much all year. Earlier in the year, we had um, the ash gray blister beetle. And now this time of the year, we're seeing more of the, the black ones. And then also these striped ones are showing up. Uh, the blister beetles, they get their name um, because they contain a chemical that's called cantharidin. And that chemical, if you get it on you, it'll ca cause, uh, excuse me, cause blistering on your skin. Uh, so uh, that's the name uh, blister beetle. And it's basically a defense, uh, you know, a defense mechanism that they'll, they'll do what they call reactive bleeding. And they'll release this chemical to, you know, if they're, they feel threatened or whatever. Um, and then it can cause, again, blistering. And if you're a predator, you know, you don't really want to mess with these things. Now, when it comes to gardens, uh, these guys can be, actually, they can be defoliators. Uh, they're more of an issue for, you know, if you're producing, um, if you have a hay field, especially alfalfa, um, you know, they can cause concerns for 
uh, toxicity with horses and livestock and that kind of a thing. I could give an entire talk about that, but I'm just going to focus on the garden aspect with these things today. Um, but again, they cause defoliation. They like to feed on uh, peppers. I've seen them on green beans, radishes, uh, lots of different things. They're attracted to flowers, um, any kind of blooming plants. So they'll you'll see them feeding on weeds um, and they'll also go for actual flowers. They'll eat the flower petals. It's kind of crazy. Um, but with these things, the best management tool is really just to, you know, they're, they're a pretty good sized, you know, anywhere from a half to an inch long. Um, but you really just want to pick them off of whatever plants that they're, that they're eating or um, defoliating and just kind of drop them in a bucket of soapy water um, to kill them. That's pretty much the best way. Now, I say hand pick. If you're doing that, make sure you're wearing rubber gloves or some kind of you know gardening gloves, something that you, you're not going to want to touch them with your bare skin because you don't want to get that chemical on you um, if they freak out and decide to release some of that. Uh, but these are a couple of the common ones that we're seeing now, especially the black blister beetles, but we have had reports of the striped ones uh, as well. So we'll move on to the next slide. Another timely uh, topic here, uh, something folks are going to be seeing more and more of is squash bugs. And this is the time of year that we see more of the adults. And, you know, there's usually late stage uh, nymphs. So on the left there, that's the adult squash bug, kind of that um, darker brown color and kind of an elong, elongated body. And then the nymphs on the right, these ones, well, that one right there is uh, more of a, a late instar. It's, it's almost fully grown, I would say. Um, so they can kind of change color. The, the younger ones are more of just a solid light gray color, but as they get older, they get more of those spots and stuff that you can see um, like on this nymph. But there's something that always, you know, they'll infest um, your squash. They love pumpkins. You can see that one is right there on a, on a pumpkin plant, actually. Um, but these guys, they, they overwinter as adults, and they'll usually hatch out, you know, in the spring. In June, they're going to be maybe feeding on some of the, you know, sprouting cucurbits, and then they'll be laying eggs on those plants. Now, the best management for these because they can, you know, they can really um, cause some damage with um, on your squash plants. They have those, you know, piercing, sucking mouth parts, and um, that can really stress the plants out and cause them to even look wilted and stuff. Um, when they're laying the eggs, you want to be checking the undersides of the leaves. Those eggs, I don't have a picture on there. I should have put that on, but um, they just kind of look like these little red balls, just kind of a cluster on the on the undersides of the leaves. And if you can find those in the months of June through, you know, maybe part of July before they hatch, you can try to squish those just by hand. Um, that's a pretty good preventative tactic. As it gets later, you know, once they hatch, you can use, um, you know, an insecticide to try to uh, keep the numbers down if they get uh, too severe. If anything, you want to get the, the nymphs because they're a lot easier to kill than the adults. This time of the year, it's pretty tough. Um, but other things prevention wise, you can do crop rotations. That's huge. Uh, you know, don't plant your cucurbits all in the same spot every year. Um, Blue Hubbard squash, that's a, you, it's a trap crop that you can use that it's highly attractive to these things. So the squash bugs will all go to that blue Hubbard and then you know you can nuke that thing and <laughs> rip it out, burn it, whatever. Um, but it takes some of the pressure off of you know your pumpkins and zucchinis and that kind of thing. Um, another thing in the fall, you know, if you can remove some mulch or debris, that'll kind of reduce the overwintering sites for those adults. And then, like I said, kind of a worst case scenario, you can use insecticides. Um, I use diatomaceous earth on my zucchinis if these things show up. You just kind of powder, you know, right there at the base of the plant and try to get it some on the leaves wherever they're showing up. But one thing, if you're using an insecticide, don't apply it on the flowers, um, you know, if they're blooming, uh, because that can obviously impact your pollinators that are visiting those plants. So 
only aim at the base of the plant or on the leaves. So we'll just move right on to our next insect here. I think this is the last one. And this is kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting insect that I didn't realize we had in South Dakota until this year, but somebody brought one in and well, I was pretty surprised and kind of fascinated at the same time. So these are snail case bagworms. Uh, this is an introduced uh, insect that came over from uh, Europe during the 1940s. Um, you know, same time that World War II was going on. I don't think that's probably a coincidence <laughs> um, because they were introduced there into the mid-Atlantic states and then they kind of spread. And I think by now they're pretty much all across North America. But these are a wingless moth. Yeah, and you heard that right. It's a moth without wings. They're pretty strange. Um, and they reproduce through parthenogenesis, which means they don't need males. They just lay eggs and produce clones. It's pretty crazy. But they live in these little um, cases that kind of look like, you know, like a snail shell, basically. That's how they get their name. Um, and honestly, the first time I saw these, I thought, I mean, it's, it, I thought they kind of looked like the poop emoji. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think it kind of just looks like a little little pile of poop. But uh, and it's actually kind of part of what that shell actually is. It's it's pretty crazy. So these things will um, they'll wander around and they'll collect. Um, you know, if it's just like a little uh, greenish red worm, and it'll collect dirt, and also it will collect fecal matter, um, and it just kind of makes this spiral that it lives in. And eventually, uh, these things, you'll see them kind of attaching themselves to uh, different, I don't know, they, they'll go on buildings, you'll see them on cars. Uh, the lady that brought these in, they had them on uh, their patio furniture and all over their deck. Um, but kind of an interesting little critter. So they kind of walk around in these shells, and then um, kind of as we get into, I don't know, midsummer, I guess, they will, uh, as they grow, they'll pupate and kind of and turn into an adult. And then the adult will then, the adult female, they're all females, she'll lay eggs in inside of her shell, and then she will leave the shell and go die somewhere. Um, and then the eggs will then hatch, the larva will go and make new shells. <laughs> Um, after they, well, they'll overwinter in the, in their mother's shell. And then in the spring they'll hatch out. And again, you have them dissipating and going, making new shells of their own. Um, these things, they'll show up in your garden. They can, um, cause like very slight defoliation on, you know, like fruit trees and, and ornamental bushes and stuff like that. They kind of will feed on just about anything, but it kind of looks very similar to like leaf miner, uh, damage, if you're familiar with that, kind of just little trails, um, not quite feeding completely through the leaf tissue. But again, it's very minor, something that, you know, you wouldn't really need to manage at all. But the main thing is just seeing these little guys showing up all over on the side of your house and that kind of thing. And really the best management tool is to sweep them off and dispose of them or, you know, get get out the garden hose, strong jet of water, and just hose them off of whatever they're on. Um, don't feel bad about killing these things. They're an invasive insect, and they're not supposed to be here anyway. Um, and actually, the ones that that gal brought in, I have them with me. Um, you know, in the entomology world, we always say, uh, when in doubt, rear it out. <laughs> um, with, with these guys, you know, I already know what it is, but um, I decided to keep them, and I don't know if you can see they've they've pupated, but I'm going to let them continue to stay in this jar, and I'll see if the females hatch out here in the next month or so. So with that, um, I'll wrap it up, I guess, if I'll take any questions that anybody has, but otherwise, that's all I got for you today. I see we have one question in the Q&A and, and just a reminder to our audience that you're welcome to use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen or, or use the chat if you're having trouble with the Q&A. Um, and I don't know if you want to take this one. 
or not, Patrick, but uh, leafy spurge beetles. Um, I presume the, the one that's <clears throat> used to control leafy spurge. Wondering mm -hmm. if it would work in park settings with water areas and quartzite areas over by Garrettson. That is a great question. Um, I don't really work so much with uh, the biocontrol insects, but I do have a gentleman with uh, the South Dakota Department of Ag that would be great to answer that question. Um, I might just give him uh, or give you that info for that gentleman and um, you can give him a call and, and pose that question to him because I know uh, Department of Ag does do a lot of programs there with uh, biocontrol. Sounds great. Oh, one, one, oh, a couple questions here. How do you eliminate cicadas? <laughs> Everybody would like to know that. I, huh? <laughs> I don't think you really can. I mean, that's, they, they don't really hurt anything. I know they're annoying this time of year, but um, they're just kind of something we have to live with. <laughs> You could, you could maybe eradicate them from your yard, but they'll just fly in from other places and they're all up in the trees. It's kind of hard to get rid of them. You just got to deal with it. Sorry. <laughs> and then the little creatures you showed us almost looked like slugs, but to, there is a question about what to do about slugs. Yeah, they do kind of look like slugs a little bit. Um, yeah, so with slugs, um, I gosh, I deal with those every year. And 2019 was the worst because it was a really wet year. So they were just going nuts. Um, but with slugs, you can do several different things. Um, on in, in my garden, I will sprinkle something called slug bait. Um, and I got to remember the active ingredient. I think it's aluminum phosphate or phosphite. I might get that wrong, but it's it, I think it's aluminum phosphate. Um, so it's an organic product that it works wonders. It just comes in this little shaker bottle and you just sprinkle it around wherever they're showing up um, and it'll just, it'll clean them right up. Um, that works great. There's other stuff I've heard of folks using like little, setting up little traps, like a little saucer filled with um, like stale beer. And they'll crawl into that little saucer and, and drown. And that's one way you can kill them that way. Um, I've heard fo of folks using eggshells, crushed up eggshells and stuff um, that you can kind of work similar to that slug bait and sprinkle it around. Um, but I, I recommend slug bait. That's, that's what I use. Again, it's organic. It's not going to hurt anything else. And it really does a number on the slugs but they show up every year. I, I feel you, whoever asked that question, it's, <laughs> it's a continuous battle. All right, thank you, Patrick. Now we'll go to uh, away from the creepy crullies and to the, the beautiful flowers of McCrory Gardens. Christina, are you ready? Yes, hi. <laughs> I am ready. Hi, everybody. So yeah, we have some awesome things coming up at Mercury Gardens. Um, um, they're in Brookings, South Dakota. So if you guys are in the area, there's some really awesome things happening at the Botanic Garden. Um, insect Festival is September 11. So talking about insects, we get to, I mean, on that topic, we get to sort of celebrate um, our insects. And, you know, for all those ones that people considered pests, there's thousands that are really beneficial and wonderful. And we want to celebrate those insects. And um, we you could eat an insect, you could, you could we are going to do, be doing monarch tagging. So you'll get to see kind of how we're doing that. Um, we're going to have Madagascar hissing cockroaches, which believe it or not, in my household are pets. So we'll be having those there too. Um, you could see or hold, and we also have cockroach races. Um, and we're going to have different education things and insect photo contest. So if you guys haven't checked that out, um, on our Facebook page, um, if you have any photos of insects that you've been taking over the year, you can um, submit them to McCrory Gardens 
um, and they'll post them in our uh, photo Facebook photo contest and then they'll also be printed and displayed at the festival itself um, so that's a really fun thing to kind of see what other people you know see them through other uh, um, through all of your eyes the insects that are out there in the gardens um, there's some actually super super beautiful ones um, and it's fun to see the photos people come up with um, edible insects and different games and crafts and stuff like that. So, and well, oh, a pollinator parade. So you can come dressed in a costume. So how fun is that? You can dress up like, like an insect um, and have a reason to dress up when it's not even Halloween. So it's a really fun, really super fun day that has become kind of one of my favorite events of the year. So um, definitely check that out on Saturday, September 11 from 10 to 2 p.m. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's free admission and um, we will have a food truck there on um, the backyard barbecue and grill too if you want to just catch some lunch while you're there um, to a fun thing for the whole family. So um, that's oh and the last thing I'll mention is the assemble an arthropod if you want that is this really fun activity that the schools have done too um, but it's open to everybody including adults <laughs> if you want to just uh, you know, assemble an, an insect or other arthropod. We included those. You can have spiders and things like that too um, that um, will be on display. You can use any materials in your house or anywhere to create um, a sort of anatomically correct insect and enter it into our contest. And that's a really fun activity too. So visit our website and Facebook and things for more info on those things. You can go to the next slide. Party on the porch is another thing coming up. So that is the Sundays in September. So 12th, 19th, and 26th from 12 to 3. Food trucks, music. You can just kind of have a picnic in the garden. So some really fun opportunities to come uh, see the gardens. So you can go on to the next one. So what's blooming in the garden right now? Um, uh, all kinds of different species of liatris. But this week, I thought I'd talk about the Ligula stylus, which is... Um, this tall one, sort of more of a button liatris with these little buttons of, and it's probably almost as tall as I am in the garden. And they are loaded with monarchs right now. You kind of feel like you're in a sort of magic fairy land when you walk through there because they just burst and flutter everywhere when you walk by. Um, so that's definitely something to check out. These, this particular group of them is behind um, the visitor center in the terrace garden there, but they're kind of scattered throughout the garden as well. So you can go on to the next one. Um, mountain ashes, this isn't necessarily, this is just kind of one to mention because a lot of people ask me what it is because it's very showy right now because it's got all these berries, these fruits on it. And so the mountain ash, you'll see all, you know, these bright red clusters or kind of an orangey red clusters in them. So that tree is the mountain ash. Um, if you do notice that it is really showy this, this time of the year and it holds those for quite a, quite a while too. You can go on to the next one. Hollyhocks. So I just really, this one is always a standout for me. It's such a deep, deep kind of burgundy, almost black color. And I actually sadly don't know the cultivar. <laughs> I need to, well, I haven't been able to find it. Um, it hasn't been marked since I've known, but it's, um, it is a hollyhock. And so, you know, I think it might've been part of a mix actually, but um, they're actually really, really lovely. This is over by the, um, over by the, um, cottage garden. Sometimes you'll know, um, people that are familiar with them know that they can kind of tend to volunteer themselves. And, but um, it's a great filler flower for um, a lot of areas and kind of a classic favorite, I think in a cottage garden style. So I enjoy those. And you can make little like people, dress people. A lot of people say that. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you can use the flowers for a skirt. Anyway, you can go on to the next one. <laughs> Um, this is kind of a, a more unusual, I think it's more unusual. I don't see it very often. Um, people often think it's a zinnia. It's an annual that we grow, or it's an annual for us that we grow this Tithonia um, torch flower, but they are just beautiful. I really love them. They're very striking orange color, kind of an orange red. There's a couple different um, cultivars colors out there um, but they're all kind of species of tithonia and um, 
definitely I would try them. If you ever see the seed out there or see them in the greenhouse, they can get quite large and covered in blossoms and the butterflies really, really love them. So that's one to one to watch for. This one in particular is in the butterfly garden and they're also in the cottage garden as well. Um, and then just elderberries. Elderberries are, you know, I guess again, it's not the flowers. The flowers are earlier in the year, but all these little berries are on the elderberries. So at um, here at home on the farm, we actually were collecting them the last week or two um, and have made some elderberry syrup and hoping to do some other recipes like jams and maybe wine and things like that. But um, elderberries are a really cool, really cool thing that you'll notice are in bloom right, uh, right now um, all over the garden. And, you know, eat, I wouldn't recommend necessarily eating them raw, but um, when you process them into jams and syrups and things, they can have really good, um, like immune, they're supposed to be good for your immune system and things like that. So a really cool thing blooming out in the garden right now, or I mean in fruit right now in the garden. So I think, I don't know if that's my last one or maybe there's one more. Um, oh, no, that was the end of mine. So um, again, thank you guys for, you know, seeing the flowers that are in bloom. Really, like I say, every week, it's really hard to narrow it down. You could kind of see in the background, there's just so many things blooming right now. And it's a really fun time to explore the garden. So we hope to see you there and check out the insect fest and the party on the porch. So. Thank you, Christina. It's always fun to see what you've gotten this week. Yeah, thank Christine, you. Christine, you can take it away. I just want to personally attest to the profusion of butterflies around the Liatris. It truly, it's like being in a butterfly house, but getting to be outside. It's absolutely gorgeous right now at McCrory. So um, I'm going to kind of carry the same theme of McCrory Gardens. And that's because of one of the things we have at McCrory that has maybe been touched on on Garden Hour, but maybe hasn't but was recently featured in Third Thursday. So Chris Schlenker gave a tour of the trial gardens at McCrory. And um, in the month of August, I had the opportunity to tour the trial gardens at Colorado State University over in Fort Collins. And I realized perhaps this is something that you've been at a botanic garden or been to a university garden and um, walked right by and maybe not realized what it was. So what is a trial garden? What's the purpose of it? Um, so at McCrory Gardens, we have annual trial gardens as well as a perennial trial garden. And the purpose really is, um, as, as you probably know, if you walk into a garden center, there are so many different petunias to choose from or so many different coral bells or you know, an overwhelming number of possibilities. And so trial gardens really help try to narrow those possibilities down. And also, um, you know, some of these annuals are bred, uh, a lot of our annuals are bred on the West Coast, for example, or in climates that might be very different from what we have here in the Midwest and here in South Dakota. So these trials are a great opportunity to see how annuals and perennials perform in our, um, in our conditions. And as perennials, as those of you who grow perennial plants know, we have our USDA hardiness zones that perennials are rated for based on the, the minimum cold temperatures over winter. And that gives an indication of will this plant survive here where I live in South Dakota? or do I need to treat it as an annual or consider planting something else? Um, so with our tr perennial trials, this is a great way to cross check those USDA hardiness zones, especially as we have some of these wonky winters or less snow cover and conditions um, might be a little bit different than when those plants were tested. So trial gardens really help, um, they help plant breeders know, should we release this material? They help garden centers know, should we carry this on our shelves? And they help you as gardeners know, hey, should I put this in my home garden? So whether it's you know visiting McCrory or if you have a chance to go out to Fort Collins and um, look at their gardens or tour you know, the University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum or a lot of these wonderful public sites, um, it's a great chance 
to see how those plants are doing. So I'm, I'm fairly new as a, a perennial plant and annual flower evaluator. And in fact, I had the opportunity to walk the gardens with Dr. Graper and we had a great discussion about um, his experiences as a trial evaluator and really studying these gardens up at McCrory. But at the end of the day, um, it's really about comparing and contrasting what does the foliage look like? How is, you know, is this coleus larger or smaller than the one next to it? Is that a good or a bad thing? Is it just more compact? Are stems breaking and falling over? Are, you know, does it look like Japanese beetles prefer munching on this one or munching on um, its neighbor next to it? Is this plant more susceptible to powdery mildew? Um, you know, looking at comparing zinnias, for example, which can get powdery are pretty susceptible, can be pretty susceptible to powdery mildew. It's also a great opportunity to compare, you know, bloom times. Does this sunflower bloom earlier or later than the one next to it? And, um, you know, are these plants doing better in the ground or in the container? So um, I, I share all of this because I think all of you on this call could be plant evaluators. It's really about making judgment calls and um, noticing subtle differences, if you will. If you've ever done those newspaper um, side-by-sides, find five things that are different um, between the pictures, sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it, there's, you know, I really can't tell if um, the foliage on this plant is any different than the one next to it. And it might be that they're the same. Um, but just to, to give you a, a look inside my head, I guess, um, I've been doing this once a month um, from the months of May through October, looking at the annuals and perennials. For our annual plants, we'll likely stop in September, and then for our perennial plants, we'll go through October and see how they're doing after um, some freeze events. And what you can see here is my niece and sister-in-law are looking at the All-American Selection Trials. So Rhoda, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Um, I wanna talk specifically about the All-American Selections Trial. You perhaps have seen their small round lo logo with AAS on some plant material that you've purchased before. And while that is, you know, partially um, marketing. I, I wanna let people know that All American Selections is a nonprofit organization and they organize trials of annual, um, annual bedding plants. So flowers like you can see here in this photo, perennial plants, as well as vegetables. And they work with botanic gardens and universities across the United States. And these are rigorous studies. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is when plant breeders have a, um, let's talk about the zinnias, for example, they're in the middle of the photo. When they have a new zinnia that they're interested in testing, they'll submit it to all American selections. They'll provide information about, you know, this should be planted in full sun or planted in the shade. This is how it should be cared for. We're interested in knowing more about these characteristics. And here are two plants that we would like it compared against. But when we receive it in our trial garden, we don't know who the breeder is, so we don't know where it came from, and we don't know the name. So we're kind of judging it blind, if you will, and then comparing it to two things that are already on the market. And one of the questions that we have to answer is, um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this plant compared to the um, two comparisons that have been provided? And it's a really intriguing question. And I've really enjoyed throughout the summer standing and looking at these plants. And again, sometimes it's subtle differences, but the reason, and for this trial, we're asked to evaluate at least six times throughout the season and spread that out throughout the growing season. And we're asked to do that because plants that might look really good in the spring um, might start to decline earlier than expected in the middle of the summer. This summer has been a great, great chance to put these plants through, um, through the test, so to speak, in terms of heat tolerance and um, how they're doing in this nice hot summer that we've had. So with All American Selections, we, we take, collect all of this data. Um, it is the digital age. So it, sometimes it looks like I'm standing next to the field and I'm texting, but I'm actually entering the data into an application that goes, to, goes directly to the organization. 
and then we'll give it a final rating at the end of the season. And plants that score high enough become all American selection winners. And then they, you'll likely see them the following year, maybe two years later in your local garden center with that AAS sticker on there. So um, just know when you see that, that that's a plant that has been in countless trials across the United States and um, has really proven itself and not just been judged by Christine Lang, but been judged by a whole team of scientists across the United States. And I put the website up there. If you're interested in looking for some new plant material ideas, or I get asked um, often, you know, what vegetables should I plant in containers? And sometimes I don't have you know, 10 great suggestions for tomatoes off the top of my head. But what's great about um, this landing page for winners is you can filter, um, you can look up vegetables, you can look up flowers, you can look up perennial flowers, and you can filter, you know, I'm looking for something to plant in the ground, like you can see in the photo here, or I'm looking for something that does really well in the container. Also, knowing that we are a geographically diverse state, you can also search by region. So um, South Dakota, we are technically in the Heartland region, but for my the gardeners on the call who are in the Black Hills and dealing with kind of more um, unique gardening challenges, you could look at um, the West Northwest data because those are annuals and plants that have been trialed in states, including Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. Um, so just something to keep in mind as far as what all this trial data is about. And um, if you'll jump to the next slide, Rhoda, I, I want to point out, so I mentioned homework. So thinking about trial gardens and making comparisons, Again, um, I would just encourage you to take up a little bit of citizen science um, and just start making, this would be considered observational data in your own garden, but this is my own second story patio garden. This was what it looked like when I planted some of my cool season crops in May. And if we see the next photo, you'll see how things are looking now um, with some pets included, of course but my garden has grown, it's expanded. And I've learned a lot this year about um, how plants responded to my soil mix, how they responded to my watering schedule, which was sometimes a little, um, little lacking. So I have one salvia plant that has now fully wilted and um, rehydrated several times. I should bring a before and after photo for next week because it's been impressive. But I say all of this because this is a great time before we get a frost, before we slip even further into fall and you know apple picking and pumpkin carving, to look critically at your garden and say, did I like how that plant performed or would I like to replace it next year? Um, did I like how much stuff I had in my 12 inch container garden or should I maybe include a few less plants because I just couldn't keep it watered and it overgrew and it looked, it just didn't look well. So I would encourage you whether it's through photographs or through, you know, opening a note on your phone or a good old fashioned journal and just writing some things down. But that's my homework for all of you. And I'm gonna go home and do this as well because I haven't taken enough photos recently. But I'm gonna jot down some notes on plants that I plan to include in my garden next year and plants that, you know what, I'm gonna skip it or put it somewhere else. So that's my homework to you. Think about your garden, make it a, a bit of a trial garden and evaluate how it's doing. All right, so I have a few events that we need to talk about. Um, adding on to what Christina was saying about Insect Festival, let's just say the month of September is going to be a fun month. So as many of you know, um, the South Dakota State Fair is this weekend, and I'm, I'm new to South Dakota, so I look forward to exploring the State Fair on Thursday. And the spot that I'm going to be is the Horticulture Building. So the Horticulture Building is where you can find all of the judged materials, the wonderful displays. Many of our Extension Master Gardeners are going to be on hand, and throughout the weekend, you'll also have a chance to meet um, and visit with a few of your favorite Garden Hour celebrities, including Dr. Amanda Bachman, as well as Brett Owens of the Local Foods Education Center. Um, 
Another shout out I'll give is um, Tanner Eakin from SDSU Facilities. He's a ISA certified arborist. He'll be on hand answering tree questions. So if you look up um, information specific to the horticulture building on the State Fair website, you can see the entire speaking schedule, but that is a great place to be. You can also visit the general SDSU extension booth and specialists um, ranging from entomologists to weed specialists to folks who work in our food and families program and um, you know, master food preservers, things of that nature, they will also be on hand. So look for SDSU extension in a few places at the state fair. And um, the next event I'd love to talk about is for those of you who would are around Brookings or would like to make a trip to Brookings, we'd invite you to the Home and Market Garden Field Day. And again, this is gonna be a great chance to see some of your favorite garden hour celebrities. Dr. Rhoda Burroughs is gonna be on hand talking about food safety. We're gonna have specialists talking about tomato, grape and pumpkin production. Not all together, those will be separate talks. Um, we'll have folks on hand from McCrory Gardens, as well as our um, new farm to school program coordinator, Anna Barr is gonna be there. Um, Connie Tandy from our plant diagnostic clinic is going to be on hand. And since this is at the local foods education center, some of the students will be assisting with tours. So this will be a chance to see things that they've grown all summer, how those plants are looking. Um, and it's also a chance to see a movable high tunnel. So um, if you're curious what a movable high tunnel is, please come. We'd love to have you. This is going to be a rain or shine outdoor event and it's family friendly and it's open to anyone in the public. So um, we look forward to seeing you and I'll be promoting this one more time next week. And with that, we've got one more slide. Rhoda, I'm gonna invite you to jump on with me. Um, I just wanna set the stage. So I've been growing, doing some trials of grafted tomatoes and I, you know, maybe that'll be my last garden hour presentation in September as an update on how those plants did overall. But um, so these are heirloom tomatoes. The tomatoes in the photo specifically are German Johnson. And my last several harvests, um, I've had a lot of plants or a lot of fruit where the shoulders, if you will, of the fruit have not ripened. And you know what? I picked several of these. I let them sit on my kitchen counter for an extra week. And finally, my husband is like, can we please throw these away? Um, I knew what it was, but I just wanted to push the envelope and confirm, confirm by abuse. But Rhoda, can you talk about what's going on with my tomatoes? <laughs> Well, this is something that shows up. It shows up more in heirloom tomatoes generally because breeders have tried to get rid of this characteristic, uh, but it can be a reaction to heat. Um, and when temperatures get over about 90, 95 degrees, uh, the tomato actually can't form that red coloring. And so we'll, we'll tend to get that. Um, it may sometimes look like sunburn too, but sunburn is a little more bleached looking. Um, sometimes it's associated with not enough potassium in the soil. That could be the case if it's container grown, uh, but almost all of our South Dakota soils, if you look at the soil tests, the, they all say very high or very, very high <laughs> potassium. So that's not usually the culprit. Uh, people do like to put Epsom salts sometimes on their gardens and Epsom salts are magnesium and plants can sometimes take up magnesium in lieu of potassium. So if you're putting a lot of Epsom salts, you might actually cause this problem. Uh, so it's, it, it tends to be one of these things that scientists have studied for decades or possibly even hundreds of years, I'm not sure, uh, and still don't have a, a cut and dried answer, but it's more a number of things feed into this, including the, the uh, variety, the soil, the temperature, yeah. Yeah, and, and maybe I, even humidity. Yeah. 
And I should add that I did um, look at my soil test report side, side by side with what I added to mine and we should have been good on potassium. So I did, I, my head went to heat as well. And I saw there was a clarifying question. Um, these were German Johnson tomatoes. And I should point out that the yellow brandy wine and the, the yellow brandy wine showed no signs of yellow shoulder, which also would be hard to see because of the yellow, but it would look more green. And the Cherokee purple, they're suffering more from cracking from the recent rainfall and me not picking quite quick enough versus um, and a little bit of yellow shoulder, but it's been most pronounced and really easy to see on the red flesh of the German Johnson. <laughs> I should note that this wouldn't necessarily, it's not going to be harmful for you to eat. No. Um, it may not have the flavor, or the texture underneath that. Sometimes it gets kind of a whitish thickening underneath that. Uh, so it might not work as well for your, for your salads or your slicing, but, but it won't harm you. Yeah. My solution has always been to lop that shoulder off and save the bottom for saucing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that leads us into vegetables, and I'm just going to go straight into them. And uh, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about what things will ripen further after harvest and what don't. And sometimes you think some very closely related vegetables would act the same way, but they don't. Uh, cantaloupe will ripen after picking, uh, as long as it's far enough along. Uh, but watermelon will not. Uh, they will spoil, but they won't ripen further. Uh, apples will develop more sugar with time. Uh, tomatoes, of course, we know can be picked green and, and will turn red. And then a lot of our fruits, plums and pears, uh, it may surprise you to know that winter squash can actually develop more flavors uh, even into months after storage. Uh, so there's, there's a variety of different uh, reactions as far as will it ripen after harvest. Um, strawberries will not, uh, but plums will. So uh, just a whole range. Now, one of the reasons I'm pointing this out is these, uh, with the exception of the squash, these fruit on the left, including the tomatoes, if you store them with certain vegetables, can decrease the storage life or the quality of those vegetables. So I'm going to take a look here. So these are ones that should not be stored with apples, pears, or or tomatoes next to uh, next to your tomatoes on the counter or, or in your uh, storage bin or, or if you've got a, a storage cell or some sort. Well, what happens? Let us see these little brown spots there. That can be caused by ethylene damage. And this can actually sort of ruin the taste of your lettuce as, as well. So this is if you're putting both your apples and your, your lettuce, you know, in the same crisper drawer. Uh, usually you won't see this if the, your crisper drawers are separated by some space, um, but it's not a bad idea to make sure things are, are put into plastic bags or containers as well. So kind of trying to keep that ethylene, which is what the, what the ethylene is a ripening, natural ripening, compound in in fruits and that's what is trying to ripen the lettuce and the broccoli as well so it's it's causing it to lose its storage uh, shelf life uh, very quickly so broccoli florets you know instead of that nice green that they're coming in the grocery store start to turn yellow right away and again they can get off flavors uh, if you're storing your apples say in a cellar uh, your potatoes and onions may start sprouting from that ethylene. Uh, carrots, you don't want to put them in the same bin with, with uh, apples because it can turn the carrots, it can ruin the flavor of the carrots. Uh, cucumbers and, 
and summer squash uh, may turn yellow and have shortened storage life. Um, and I'll mention that both cucumbers and summer squash actually probably will have longer shelf life on your counter, especially if you can find a cool spot or in a, or in a cooler cellar. They actually can get refrigerator damage after a couple days in the refrigerator. So you kind of have, have a trade off there of, of where you put things. And I wanted to talk a little bit about storage, uh, starting with carrots. And, and one of the questions I had in the last week was, uh, how do you know when to harvest carrots? Basically, you can harvest them anytime they're big enough that you want to eat them. <laughs> so you can have little baby carrots if you want when you're thinning carrots, or you can wait uh, until they're until they're a good size. Uh, when they're full size, this bottom tip tends to get a little bit blunt, uh, but that'll depend a little bit on variety too. But the best the best way to tell if they're ready is to pull one and, and see if it's uh, at a stage that you want. Um, should you wash them before storage? You know, it, it, it's kind of hard sometimes to put muddy things in your refrigerator or at least things that have dirt clinging to them, but generally they will stay uh, longer in storage. If you don't wash them, washing takes off some of the protective coating on the fruit or the vegetable. Um, so if you don't have to wash them, it, it's better not to. And then, of course, wash them before you eat them. Uh, if you do wash them, make sure they're air dried or, or uh, with a damp towel or with a paper towel, I mean, uh, so that they're damp and not wet. If you've got free water on the surface, that's a great place for bacteria to get started and for the for the vegetable or fruit to start rotting. So make sure they're, they're damp, but not wet. Uh, carrots, of course, should be stored in the refrigerator. Uh, many places over the years have used in-ground storage. So if you don't have a cellar, uh, one option is to sink a, like a garbage can into the soil. You can figure out somebody who's willing to dig that hole for you. Um, and then you can layer them with moist sand. And when you've got it down deep enough in the ground, it keeps it cool, um, but doesn't freeze, you know, unless we have one of our really awful winters, uh, doesn't freeze covered with straw mulch or a couple straw bales. <clears throat> and we used to do this in North Dakota and, and be able to actually dig carrots out in, in December or January. Cabbage is another one I get questions about. Is it ready to pick? Well, whatever size you want, <laughs> basically. Uh, one, one caution, though, in our, <clears throat> in our drought year, um, has it sort of has those cells kind of shrink up as there's not enough not quite enough water and then we get that sudden rain it can take up water quickly enough it just splits the whole head apart uh, which is not a good situation if this happens you want to harvest it and use it right away because it'll start to rot um, one thing you can do to help that avoid that if you know it's been dry and, and you know you're going to get a couple inches of rain uh, take the whole head and just turn it 90 degrees and then it'll then it'll break just a few roots off on the bottom so it can't take up water quite as quickly and that may help uh, keep it from splitting and then the onions uh, once the top starts to fall over and we see that right now uh, pull them up but leave the tops on what we want to do to get onions to store well is to suck all the water out from the neck right at the top of the bulb if that doesn't get dried out enough right we'll start in there so if we take our onions put them in a dry place it doesn't have to be in the sun uh, 
and allow them to air dry for a couple of days to up to a couple of weeks. If you've got a greenhouse, that's a wonderful place just to sit them. Uh, but in a warm shed is fine, as long as it's well ventilated, doesn't have to have light. And then once those outer skins have turned brown or red and the uh, leaves are all dried up, then you can cut off the leaves and, and store the bulbs in the refrigerator. Uh, they will last longest in the refrigerator. Uh, they can also be stored at room temperature, but they won't last as long. And I think I'm going to save uh, potatoes for, no, one more here, beans. We'll talk about potatoes next week. Uh, beans actually can get cold damage by putting them in the refrigerator. You can put them in the refrigerator for a couple of days before this starts showing up. But if you try to store them in the refrigerator for longer than that, you'll start to get this water soaking, these dark green areas and you can start to get rot into that then. Uh, or you can get these brown areas. So they actually like it about 45 to 50 degrees. If you've got a cellar, again, that's a wonderful place to store them. Uh, but if not, you may be better off keeping them on your counter as long as uh, you put them in a, in a bag with a little bit of moisture, not a lot. Uh, just enough to keep them from, from uh, from wilting, from drying out quite a bit. Uh, so uh, give that a try or put some in your refrigerator and some on your counter and find out what works best for you. With that, I am going to skip over actually to our extension garden hotline. Uh, reminding you, if you did not get your an questions answered today, uh, you can call any of the three regional centers, or you can email them and send them photos, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, this is free to anyone, and we will get back to you. If they don't know the answer, it comes up the, up the chain to Christine and I, or, or John Ball, or, or our entomologist. So uh, you're welcome to contact these at any time. Uh, and the, sometimes some of those will actually get put up to uh, garden hour as well. If we find something that's really interesting with a good photo, you may actually see it on, on garden hour sometime. With that, I want to thank our panelists tonight. Uh, Patrick and Christine. Yeah, thank you. And Christina already had to leave. So uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to visiting with you next week. And uh, again, if you have questions during the week, uh, submit them to the hotline, or you can actually submit them to SDSU Extension, and, and we may get them on the show for next week. Have a good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.